The following program is a SUTV student production. The views expressed are not necessarily those of Salisbury University, the University System of Maryland, its regents, administration, officers, employees, or representatives. I'm Derek Sander, and today I'm joined by Jennifer Clymer, a Salisbury University alumna and the executive producer and co-director of a documentary, Be Prepared to Stop. So, obviously, you're here showing the documentary. So what exactly is the documentary about? Uh, it's about the nation's infrastructure and the transportation industry. A lot of people don't realize that everything you interact with on a daily basis depends on trucking and the trains and the roads being solid and secure. And uh, this invisible industry that we've all had the good fortune to kind of take for granted needs a little bit of our attention and, and love. I, I want people to understand how one of your bridges falls, one of your roads starts to be impassable, and it's going to um, seriously impact your way of life. Five days without a truck, like we have these um, points in the documentary of what happens one day without a truck getting to you, two days, three days, and by the fourth day, there's no money in the ATMs, there are no clean linens in your hospitals, there's no potable water, like it's, it's a real problem really quickly. So day five is just yeah. pandemonium and the zombie apocalypse and we don't yeah. want to get there. Yeah. yeah. So what inspired the, this film being created? Uh, so my grandfather was a truck driver and I was taught from a very young age to have um, respect for the roads, to drive really safely, not just around your fellow drivers, but especially around trucks because trucks are carrying an 80,000 pound load. Your car is maybe three to 5,000 pounds, depending on what you're driving. If you're not intelligent in how you drive and thoughtful about the way that you maneuver around trucks, the, just the physics of it, it means you're not gonna win. Yeah. And um, I live in Los Angeles now, have, after having graduated from here and I moved to Chicago for a short amount of time and moved to LA because I wanted to make films that made a difference in people's lives. Uh, and I was on the roads in Los Angeles wanting to gently take people off to the side and shake them ever so slightly and say, what are you doing? <laughs> like, you're in a rush to go probably to a store yeah. to buy whatever's on the back of the truck that you just cut off yeah. at your own peril. Like, the truck driver is going to feel badly that you're dead, but the way that you cut him off, that's entirely yeah. your fault. And the impact that that has just in that small circle of people can't get through it's you know it's bad overall so if we just take our time sit back and understand why driving on these roads um, in a respectful way is important it, it could save a lot of lives yeah. and then the more I found out about this topic uh, the more that I discovered people's lives really are hanging in the balance but not because of irresponsible driving or distracted driving or drunk driving, infrastructure in and of itself is costing the lives of hundreds of people every day. It's the equivalent of a 747 falling out of the sky every other day. And wow. if, if that was happening, if people understood the gravity instead of it being one person's life here and one person's life there, but consolidated across the country, you begin to realize somebody yeah. needs to to really talk about this topic. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So you mentioned that you're from LA right now. That's where you, that's where you are um, currently living. So is that where this documentary is set? No, um, it's, and it's actually not even where the inspiration for it happened. Mm -hmm. um, I executive produced another documentary called Show Folk, and that was doing the festival circuit. So I was in Washington, D.C. to promote that and was waiting for my hotel room to be ready and was sitting in the lobby just chatting with people because one of the things yeah. I just love to do and, uh, and started talking to a guy from the trucking industry and he owns his own trucking company and I, I said, you know, I, love, I really love truck drivers. Yeah. He said, nobody says that. <laughs> Who are you? Yeah. Like, where did that come from? And, um, through talking to him, I realized that 
this was a real issue across the country. And the reason that he was in D.C. at that time was to try and help lawmakers understand that people are willing to pay a little bit more for their gas tax. If they understood that it was going to the Highway Trust Fund, mm -hmm. which only goes toward maintenance and rebuilding and hopefully if there's enough in the coffers there, towards progress, towards new roads, towards self-healing concrete. Like, as you start to dig into a documentary, you, you discover these fascinating things that nobody yeah. knows about, yeah. you know? Um, Self-healing concrete, like, yeah. that's who a knew? real thing. Yeah, who knew? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so no, it's not set in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. We interviewed people all across the country. We um, have footage from Oregon to Richmond to um, uh, Minnesota. Uh, we, we talk to people everywhere. Yeah, so how long did the documentary take from start to finish to Forever. shoot? No, um, <laughs> we're pretty fortunate. Most documentaries uh, do take years. They're yeah. passion projects that, um, like, I was co-producer co on a movie called Dear Mr. Watterson, and that was a passion project that took many, many years, and he was cobbling together footage, and whenever he had money, he was shooting. The way I approached this documentary was, this is a really important topic that we have to make instrumental change right now. So I went and found funding, and from the time that we shot the sales reel to the time we wrapped production, it was about two and a half years. Wow. And then it took about a year to really get distribution up and underneath it. And, and then the political world turned upside down, and we didn't really have a toehold to be able to say, oh, look, we're talking about infrastructure right yeah. now because the news cycle is so, yeah. um, you know, ADD currently. Yeah. So. Uh, that's why this is, it's going to be a long process. Mm -hmm. The facts that are in this film have not changed. And fortunately, because we shot it before the administration um, changed into the, the current um, exciting administration that we currently have, um, there isn't any president in this. It, mm -hmm. It's more about the people who are doing the work on the ground. It's about the people who are driving um, coast to coast or you know, up and down each coast. Yeah. Um, so it is, it is timeless in that sense. Yeah. yeah. And for people who are a little um, news weary of what's currently in the news, mm -hmm. if you guys know what I'm gently saying, <laughs> yeah. um, again, there are no presidents in yeah. this film. Yeah. Yeah. That's very interesting. So um, what exactly made you decide to come and show it at Salisbury, your alma mater? You just answered well, that, your own yeah. question, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, I love this school. I love everything that it gave for me. It was such a, fa a wonderful foundation. The professors here were so um, positive and encouraging. And I, I talked to a professor that was really important in my journey last night and, and thanked him. And he was like, why? And I said, it's as simple as you really told me that I could do it, and, and I believed you. And that's what makes the difference. Yeah. Anybody authentically looking into your eyes and saying, I, I see what you can do, and I know that you're gonna make it. Yeah, so was coming back here kind of reaffirming that thing that you kind of had to discover that, oh, I can do this, was coming back here kind of reaffirming that for you? It's been such an interesting um, journey to come back here because there there are corners of this campus that have changed dramatically. I mean, the, the explosion of new buildings and the access to equipment that you guys have in this department, like this studio and these cameras were not something that, that we had. Um, and I know just from having spoken to some of you in, in the classes, the, the foundation that I had has improved by a hundredfold, and I'm really excited to see what all the students here are going to be able to do. But for me, even walking into those just physical areas that no longer have the same look still have the same feeling to me. Like there mm -hmm. are these really vivid memories that have, have come back that are more inspiration. It's yeah. been fantastic. Yeah, so you just mentioned like not having maybe the resources that we have now or different resources at least. Mm -hmm. So how did you get 
not get like super crazy successful obviously you have done so many awesome things. I am awesome super things. crazy yeah. successful. <laughs> obviously you have done so many awesome things. I'm putting things. that on my IMDb page by the way. <laughs> Derek super says awesome. super yeah. crazy successful. Um, you've done all these amazing projects so yeah. how did you um, get into that world from this school that isn't necessarily a number one film school or a number one production school? Yeah um, it's interesting, somebody asked me yesterday if I thought that it was important for people to go to graduate school. And I think for some people it is, but um, for me, it was about getting out there, taking opportunities that, that were low pay, but high yield in terms of educational op options and, um, and networking. The more people that you start to connect with and that you work with and the, the more opportunities that you're saying yes to, um, it just expands your base. So when I was in Chicago and, and saying yes to a myriad of things um, and meeting these really creative, fascinating, interesting people, um, I was part of a theater that started that's still running. I was part of the Chicago Improv Festival's first two years. And um, helping to, to create out of nothing is something that I've always thrived on um, but through those those connections and those people I was able to get out to Los Angeles and have a network kind of pre-established for me like the people that I plugged into who were LA transplants from Chicago helped really ease the path for me to um, to continue networking and I, I, I hate to put it this way but um, there were certain parts of what I did that I didn't need an education for at all. I just needed the willingness to be open to fail and to be ready to ask for guidance when I was in that, that zone. But a lot of the production work that I had, the acting experience that I got through here, the, the communication skills, just the baseline communication skills are what led me to um, continue to be able to keep my head above water in situations that other people may have been like, this is overwhelming. And you, you eat the elephant one bite at a time, you know? Yeah, well, to finish off, that was a ton of great advice. <laughs> um, if you could add one more thing to it, one piece of advice for anyone who is aspiring to be in a film, what would that be? Um, huh. A few things that I said to the class, uh, to a couple of the classes yesterday. Um, don't be a jerk. And I may have said it in a more um, <laughs> vulgar way. But be pleasant to work with because the people that you are working around, they will bring you on to their next thing. You will want to bring people who you enjoyed working with when you have the opportunity to, to lead the train. Um, always back up your media and file it properly. <laughs> Um, put it on the cloud as soon as possible. Never check it in your luggage. Um, yep. When you are traveling, uh, always have a fresh pair of clothes on you because you don't know what's going to happen to your luggage. Um, anything that you can do that is preventing any of those little fires, like the more you can step back and say, where can things go wrong? Okay, here are how I can mitigate between those four things absolutely not going wrong and these three things may go wrong but I'm ready if and when they do that that's that's how I operate and it gets um, a little maddening you have to have kind of a multitasking mind um, but it's also a lot of fun it's it's puzzle solving before the puzzles laid out in front of you yeah so that and just again always be pleasant you never know who your next job is going to come through or who you're going to be able to turn to and say, let's do something amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on and interviewing. Um, and be sure to check out uh, Be Prepared to Stop. It's a documentary that obviously was produced and co-directed um, by Jennifer Clymer. So thank it's you. It's on again. Amazon. It's Amazon. on iTunes. Uh, it was uh, co-produced by Yvette Nicole Brown and narrated mm by um, Yvette. She does a, a wonderful job. Um, and uh, there are a few people here on campus who know how to get a hold of me. You can get a hold of me through our website, be preparedtostop.org. Um, and if you have any questions, like, 
I went here. I, <laughs> I want to help you. Yeah, get yeah. in touch. Get well, in touch. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much again for coming on, and thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.